Enrico asks, Your thoughts on the Kiva Protocol, a distributed ledger partnership between Sierra Leone, the UN, and Kiva.org? Enrico says, I have been a lender to the microfinance charity Kiva.org for many years. Hey, <laughs> so have I. Um, I've, I've been a lender on Kiva for almost 10 years now. This year, Kiva is partnering with the government of Sierra Leone and the UN agencies to provide a nationwide digital identification system designed to help the country's 7 million citizens access the financial services they need to improve their lives. The development, called the Kiva Protocol, is based on Hyperledger technology and is intended to solve the problems of identity and credit history for the 80% of the country's citizens who are unbanked. While I have no doubts about the good intentions of Kiva, I am concerned about the choice of technology. Would you clarify the pros and cons of distributed leisure technology in such a situation? What are the chances of this project making a positive contribution to the financial future of the people of Sierra Leone? So here's the thing. This distributed ledger technology is centralized. That's the key insight. And one of the reasons it's centralized is because the very process of providing uh, identification, traditional human ID in places like Sierra Leone, is itself centralized. So whether you use a decentralized blockchain or a centralized blockchain doesn't make a huge difference if the source of the identity documents, the source of the truth, the thing that you can't control by consensus, but has to be input into the system by an external party, let's call this an oracle for consistency purposes, this, the government of Sierra Leone in this particular case is acting as an identity oracle that is providing identity documentation for its citizens. And that is a centralized function that is prone to corruption and vulnerabilities and uh, lack of access and all of the other problems of identity systems. Right? Whether they take that identity information and they put it in a database, they put it in Hyperledger or they put it in a blockchain, doesn't really make any difference to the truth of that information, nor does it make any difference um, to the availability and access of that information. If that ledger is being run with all of the inputs being a single governmental agency, then whatever truth goes in, that's what truth comes out. And if it's a lie that goes in, a lie comes out. You can't create truth with a blockchain. You can only preserve truth that is already there, or you can enforce the things that are subject to the consensus rules. And of course, human identity isn't managed by consensus, it's certainly not a decentralized consensus. So, what is the benefit of this? Arguably, if you were to build a database, one of the interesting things about that database or um, interesting questions for that database is how open are the application programming interfaces that give access to that database to a variety of agencies and even private organizations to access the identity information that is contained in that database. So one of the advantages that you have by using something like Hyperledger, arguably, is that at least you have an open API, uh, a known API that can uh, be used for cryptographic validation of integrity and uh, validation of the records and making changes to those records and all of the other things that a DLT can do. So is it slightly better than a database? Marginally better than a database. Could you make it better by putting it on an open, borderless, decentralized, censorship-resistant blockchain? You could make it marginally better, again, but it would become significantly less efficient. So here we have a trade-off between the efficiency of using Microsoft SQL Server or an Oracle database on one side, all the way up to using, let's say, um, an open public blockchain, um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever, um, in order to install um, this identity information. Here's the bigger problem, though. If you give access to these APIs to public-private partnerships or private organizations, how do you protect the privacy of, this, of the people whose identity is on this blockchain? 
The problem is that open access to these databases effectively exposes everyone whose information is on this system to everyone who has access to this system. It, it becomes a surveillance database. Now, is this a good trade-off to have in a country where 80% of people don't have banking or identity or credit information and therefore do not have access to loans? The reason I invest in Kiva is because primarily because of the opportunity it gives me to extend lending to people who don't have identity documents through the use of a network of relatively decentralized uh, non-governmental organizations and charities that help people present their needs, um, document them, and then use a number of techniques to uh, help them repay their loans, including building communities and group lending, consortiums, cooperatives, and things like that, which provably decline default rates. Where if you have a group of people applying for a loan together in a community to build something that benefits the whole community, they're far more likely to repay their loan um, because they can both support each other uh, and act as a check and balance on each other in order to make sure that uh, that loan is repaid so that the credit of the group can continue to improve. None of that involves documentation. When I invest in uh, 10 Kenyan uh, women who are building um, uh, an agricultural cooperative or uh, a, a, a sewing a cooperative to make garments, I have no idea who they are. I don't need to know who they are. Um, and it doesn't matter to me whether they're documented or have a good credit rating or not. It's the power of the group that makes it. So one of the things I really don't understand is this doesn't help the Kiva model, uh, which is rather surprising. What it does is it, it moves the Kiva model more to traditional banking, where the importance of identity and credit is emphasized. I'd like to move to a world where we can do lending more and more based on the power of numbers and decentralization, whereby spreading default risk across many lenders and borrowers, removing the need for identity, opens banking to more people. We don't solve poverty by creating more identity. We solve uh, poverty, in my opinion, by making the demand for identity less prevalent, um, by opening more doors, uh, to the availability of funds, credit, commercial opportunities, and also liquidity to people who don't have uh, you know, valid government identity. We'll see. I'm very skeptical about this. I don't think the problem here is the fact that they're using hyperledger versus you know, whatever else. I think the problem here is the centralized origin of this identity and um, the uh, idea that uh, the primary problem with default in third world and developing countries that have uh, credit problems is identity. I don't think that's the case, but who, who knows? Um, we'll see. It's a, it's a good project. Maybe they'll do some research and we'll all learn something.